Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of July 21st, 2014. Before I get started, I just wanted to put in a plug in for a great CME conference that's going to be occurring, occurring in Las Vegas in early October. www.theheartcourse.com is where you can find more information about this. The conference is called The Heart Course, and on October 2nd, we're going to be conducting an EKG pre-conference course for several hours. We're going to spend time talking about some advanced electrocardiography. There's also a post-conference, by the way, that's going to be run by none other than Dr. Haney Malamut. And for all of you out there in the Twitterverse, you probably know Haney. He's one of the critical care experts and sends out a lot of great educational information. Anyway, check it out, www.theheartcourse.com. I hope to see many of you there. Okay, on to the case this week. This was sent by Dr. David Page, who is a second-year emergency medicine resident at the EM program at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. He was working in the emergency department, minding his own business one day, when suddenly two dudes came... Well, no, actually. He was working in the emergency department, minding his own business, when a 30-something-year-old man was brought into the emergency department from the scene of a motor vehicle accident. Now, the, the patient was slightly altered. His mental status was a bit off. And so, of course, you're thinking maybe there's some head trauma in the motor vehicle accident. Add to that the patient has a seatbelt sign on his abdomen. So this is probably some high-impact type of trauma case. So they started a trauma workup. But then the family shows up. And they report that the patient is an alcoholic, although he recently stopped, so no alcohol today, and he had a seizure while driving the car. That's not good. But then you start wondering, well, maybe the car accident didn't cause the altered mental status. Maybe the altered mental status caused the car accident. So whenever somebody has a first-time seizure, one of the things that you've got to do is to check a, not CAT scan, well, yeah, you might want to do a CAT scan, but get a 12 lead EKG first, all right? It's faster, and it might give you life-saving information even faster than the CAT scan. So they got a 12 lead EKG, and this is the exact reason why you get the 12 lead ECG on these patients with a presumed first-time seizure. Now, uh, if... Uh, there's no information that I'm going to give you from the EKG or interpretation up top there. So what I recommend is you hit the pause button on your iPhone or iPad or Galaxy or, or computer, or whatever it is that you're looking at, and try to figure this 12 lead EKG out. Go through your usual steps, rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, uh, ischemia, whatever normal method you use to read EKGs, just go through that for a second and you will come across the diagnosis. All right, ready? Hit the pause button. Okay, we're back. And for those of you that didn't hit the pause button, you're cheaters. All right, so as you went through your method, hopefully one of the stops along the way was intervals. You've always got to look at the intervals in your 12 lead EKGs. And if you did, you would notice that this patient's QT interval is prolonged. Even without looking at the computer's uh, calculated QTC, you should be able to recognize that this is a prolonged QT or QTC. How do you do that? Well, one simple way to do that is a little eyeball method that we've talked about before. Take two adjacent QRS complexes. Let's, let's take these two. And I'm just going to draw a line all the way up and then go halfway between the two QRS complexes. So halfway between those two is probably right around there. Now, if somebody has a normal QT, the T wave should end before the halfway point. But you clearly see that the T wave here ends beyond the halfway point. That means this is a prolonged QT or prolonged QTC. You can do that in a different lead also. Uh, let's take one of the precordial leads. Let's go halfway between these two QRS complexes. Halfway would put us probably right around there. And you can, even with a little artifact, you can clearly see that the T wave is ending beyond the halfway point. That means that this is a prolonged QT. Now, if you have the computer interpretation, the computer would tell you that the QTC is actually 651, which is way long. And I like to use a cutoff of 500 for the QTC. When the QTC is over 500 milliseconds, that's when I start to worry about the risk of arrhythmias. When the QTC is under 500, I really don't worry as much. 
Can you develop arrhythmias with the QTC of 480 or 490? Yeah, it's possible, but it's not that common. And most of the literature says that you really ought to start worrying when the QTC gets to 500. So that's the cutoff I use. Anyway, there's no doubt here. This is way long. This is way longer. And why do we worry about a prolonged QTC? Simple. We worry about polymorphic VTAC of the torsade de point uh, variety as the French would say, or for those of us that uh, can't speak French, we just call it torsade. And that's exactly what happened here. Several minutes later, they had a rhythm strip going and boom, the patient goes right into that torsade, that accordion looking type of pattern. The patient developed torsade. And this is presumably the reason that the patient's having seizures. And this is the reason why you check a 12 lead EKG on patients that have a first time seizure, because oftentimes, arrhythmias can mimic seizures. What happens when you have an arrhythmia? Well, you hypoperfuse the brain, you fall to the ground, and you start shaking because the brain is ischemic and hypoxic, if, if even just transiently. So arrhythmias, especially torsade, torsade is notorious for doing this, arrhythmias can mimic seizure activity, especially torsade can do it. And that's why you want to check the 12 at EKG because you're looking for signs that the patient may have had an arrhythmia and not a true brain seizure. And in particular, you're looking at the QTC because the patients with torsade can mimic seizures. It's very classic and very well reported. Anyway, uh, the patient was actually having intermittent episodes of torsade, at which point uh, David went ahead and treated the patient with some magnesium and that worked very nicely. Then they got some uh, electrolyte levels back and the patient's magnesium level is 0.5, normal being around two, so that's way low. And the potassium level also is low at 0.9, normal being around four to five. Uh, so what is the differential? Just a reminder, differential of prolonged QT. Well, hypokalemia can prolong your QT. Hypomagnesemia can prolong your QT. Hypocalcemia can do it as well. So I always think about all of the hypoelectrolytes as prolonging the QTC. Uh, there's many, many medications that can prolong that QTC. And there's a few other miscellaneous things. Elevated intracranial pressure. Uh, hypothermia prolongs all of your intervals. Cardiac ischemia can prolong your QT, maybe just a little bit, but I put it on the list anyway, but just, just a tiny prolongation. And then, of course, congenital or genetic reasons uh, can prolong your QTC as well. But the main thing that I would want to leave you with is that whenever you have a patient who's wide awake and alert and doing fine, but simply has a prolonged QT, please check their medication list and please check their electrolytes because you know what? Those are things that you might be able to fix in the emergency department. You might save a life just by checking that QTC and checking their lights and their medications in the emergency department. You can fix these things. So make sure to check those. I always do that when the QTC is over 500, right? So simple case on a quick summary, prolonged QTC, remember, check the lights, Check their medications in particular. There's other things that do it also that we mentioned, but check the lights and check the medications for the fifth time, all right? Why do you worry about prolonged QT? It's because you worry about torsade. Torsade is the type of polymorphic VTAC that's associated with the prolonged QT. How do you treat torsade? Well, if they're going in and out of it, you can use magnesium. If they're persistently in torsade, they're going to be unstable. You shock them. And if that's not working, you bolus them with the magnesium. You can try overdrive pacing, either electrically or with isoproteranol. Overdrive pacing with isoproteranol uh, is classic. And then once you convert them out of it, don't forget to put them back on or get them on that magnesium once you've converted them out of it because you want to prevent them from going back into it. And a key thing, once you've transiently fixed the torsade, you've got to look for the underlying cause that we've talked about here and try to fix the underlying cause. And while you're trying to figure all that out, just keep them on the magnesium. All right. And also, don't forget this. This is very classic. It's, it's so classic it shows up on the boards. It's so classic that it, it occurs in regular everyday practice. I've seen it, uh, and this is another nice case. Torsade can mimic seizures. Patients develop the arrhythmia, they hypoperfuse the brain, they fall to the ground, and they start shaking because they're not perfusing the brain. Torsade is very, very classic for 
mimicking seizures. So whenever somebody's got a first-time seizure, get that 12 EKG and take a look at that QT. Take a look for other signs of arrhythmias as well because you might discover that the patient's seizures were actually not coming from the brain, but they were being uh, caused actually by an arrhythmia. So I hope that case was helpful. My thanks again for sending that case in. Uh, and they did a great job out there in Alabama in taking care of this patient. And uh, well, I hope that case was helpful. And I look forward to talking to all of you again next week. Bye for now.